Dr. Lam Weber is a professor at Columbia University and she received her PhD from Harvard University. Before she came to Columbia, she held a faculty position at Princeton for over 20 years where she taught a freshman seminar course titled Jurassic Park, Is It a Myth or Reality? Um, unfortunately today, she isn't leading us in a discussion on the accuracy of Jurassic Park, but rather is talking to us about a single celled organism that lives in ponds, eats algae, but yet is made up of thousands of chromosomes. So Dr. Lynn Weber, you can share your screen. Um, and at the end of our talk, you can use the Q&A chat box again. Thanks, I'm trying to share screen, actually just updated Zoom and hope we don't have problems. Allow Zoom to share screen. I wanna share PowerPoint. Terrific, okay. So slight modification to the title. Um, I'm blending a few different topics, so I'm calling it more broadly um, that I'll be talking about chromosome remodeling and uh, this unicellular eukaryote here, Oxytrica, also in the screen background behind me, if you watch the video inset. Um, this is an organism which is approximately 100 microns long, so we're much bigger than archaea now, but not too far of an evolutionary scale. Um, most people now would view eukaryotes as just overgrown archaea. Uh, so it's um, a single-celled eukaryote, which means it has a true nucleus, um, but in fact this organism has more than one nucleus, and that is why it is really a paragon for studies of genome or specifically chromosome remodeling that I'll tell you about. Okay, so first a little bit about where I normally am. Um, at the moment, of, I'm actually in my third floor loft, um, although it looks to you like I'm subcellular from the background, but this is where my lab is normally found um, here overlooking the Hudson River and I'm really missing my view. So um, also a little bit of background. This is a truly outdated slide, but my homage to the late Carl Woese. Um, and I use it because um, in this particular view, based on some very old um, phylogeny of ribosomal RNA-based sequences, uh, ciliates, this group that includes oxytrica, um, as you can see, is really diverse in morphology. Some like stentor um, of my, a millimeter or so long, others on the scale, like um, more like typical microbes of just a few microns. But on some um, on evolutionary trees, they are not too divergent from plants, animals, and fungi. So they bear um, arguably a large amount of complexity, um, one of the many reasons that we like to study them. Okay, and a little bit about the life cycle of oxytrica and related ciliates. So um, here you'd have an inset of uh, pair conjugating or mating between them. And here you have the cartoon version from a textbook. And this illustrates first off that property that they have more than one nuclei, uh, which means they have more than one nuclear genome and they differ unlike some organisms that are binucleate and have nearly identical genomes. So for instance, um, we have here um, shown a smaller nucleus, which is the micronucleus and a larger nucleus, which is the macronucleus. And um, the two colors indicate the two representative versions from both parents. So conjugation between a, a, a pair of mating compatible ciliates, which is typically in the wild triggered by starvation, this leads to um, a meiosis like that of other eukaryotic genomes. And degradation in a more gradual sense of the larger nucleus. So what this means is that the smaller nucleus is the one that's contributing to the germline and to mating and to forming ultimately zygotic nuclei for the development of the next generation. And so the macronucleus on the other hand, the larger of the two um, plays a role predominantly in being the factory of messenger RNA for daily expression of the cell. And it's a specialized nucleus, not only in that context of being the one that produces messenger RNA, but it's specialized in that it also has chromosomes that have eliminated most unessential DNA that's not important or does not participate in gene regulation. So nearly all non-coding DNA can be expunged from the macronucleus. Hence, they have um, the wiring and the toolkit available to them to do genome editing on a very grand scale. So one thing I'll point out here is that at this stage, when you have um, essentially a new zygotic um, diploid cell, um, 
and it goes on to produce um, a cell which um, post uh, mitosis has two identical zygotic nuclei. At this stage, if this were an animal, and since this is a uh, developmental biology symposium, uh, this would go on to become a two cell stage embryo and divide. But the distinction here is that um, rather than dividing, the cell maintains, the oxytric or ciliate cell more generally maintains the property of being binucleate. And moreover, there is now um, still a differentiation of the roles of the two nuclei rather than a division of the cell into um, two cells at a two cell st stage embryo and then sub subsequent um, differentiation. Instead, there really is nuclear differentiation and it takes place over the course of um, roughly two to three days. And so this is a developmental phenomenon that my lab studies. Okay, so now to zoom in on chromosome architecture in the cartoon style. So within a single individual oxytrica cells, I've already mentioned there are these two nuclei, the macronucleus and the micronucleus, commonly abbreviated Mike and Mac. They differ a lot in genome content in part because as I've told you, the macronucleus um, has the ability to expunge most non-coding DNA. So over 90% of all of the DNA from the longer precursor chromosomes is simply eliminated. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean it's junk DNA as this cartoon would imply, um, but it definitely implies that um, it's not essential for functions um, in the production of messenger RNA in the macronucleus. So that means that all of the so-called intergenic DNA shown in light blue can be eliminated with very few exceptions where they do encode some regulatory sequences. So a consequence of throwing out very nearly all um, intergenic DNA comes uh, essentially as a corollary is that you wind up with tiny chromosomes in the macronucleus because they're largely devoid of non-coding DNA. And also if you're gonna eliminate intergenic DNA, you wind up having most chromosomes on single genes. So here's a schematic of the architecture, um, probably familiar to many at the Carnegie Institute because this is a system um, beautifully studied by Joe Gall over um, many decades before, long before I was aware of the system. So we have a system here where um, many of uh, the Gall laboratory um, disciples, such as uh, Ginger Zakin, went on to study the telomeres um, in the macronuclear chromosomes, precisely because if you have um, and many orders of magnitude more chromosomes in the macronucleus because of the loss of intergenic DNA, well, in order to be considered a chromosome and to pr be protected, they have to be capped with their own individual telomeres. And so you have an inordinate quantity of telomeric DNA in a ciliate macronucleus, and especially in these species like Oxytrica that um, whittle it down to um, a approximately one gene per chromosome model for genome organization. Now, some other properties of the genome organization in ciliates like Oxytrica that I wanna mention are that the information is not only uh, whittled down in the sculpting of a new macronuclear genome, but can also be remodeled and remodeled in the sense of not just um, chromatin modifications and the states of chromatin, but also reordered. So there can be programmed translocations and programmed inversions of segments like pieces two and four um, shown here could in fact be um, inverted with respect to the, um, the uh, orientation of the other segments. Now, I'm referring to these segments casually, just as segments. They are DNA elements analogous to exons that are spliced together at the DNA level to form this mature sequence or this mature chromosome in the macronucleus. Um, and that comes from the linking together of the macronuclear destined sequences, those dark colored boxes, and the elimination of not just intradenic DNA, but also internal segments that interrupt um, the retained pieces or the MDS components. So a consequence here is that to produce uh, not just the chromosomes, um, but also chromosomes that have the capacity to encode specific genes um, in the macronuclear genome, um, there's a lot of rewiring that takes place and has the ability to reorder and sculpt um, each chromosome individually. Simplest cases only require the addition of telomere sequences at the ends and the elimination of flanking DNA, but the more complex cases um, which uh, still entail well over 3,000, require reordering of these different pieces of DNA as well in this process. So I've already mentioned that they're capped by their own independent telomeres. And there's one additional layer of information to provide, which is that our sh short repeat sequences 
um, analogous, in fact, to um, the short repeats left behind by transpose on insertion. Um, at the end of every piece n, let's say at the end of piece six, that matches the beginning of piece seven. So this helps stitch together sequence information, which is sometimes over distances greater than 50 kp. We call them pointers, borrowing a term from computer science for simply short direct repeats or short sequences or strings for that matter, um, which can link together information. Um, like if you're uh, fixing up your hard drive, it would look for pointer sequences at the end of one piece of code to join it to another. So here's an example, a simple five base CAGTA repeat at the end of one piece um, segment N and repeated again at the beginning of segment N plus one. Now a caveat is that these pointers can be as small as two base pairs, like the TA base pair repeat that is commonly recognized by transposases of um, a particular family abundant in oxytrica. So the information found in pointers, even though sometimes it's more precise, like five or even 20 base pairs, um, is just part of the layers of information that help the organism sculpt together its chromosomes and its genome during nuclear differentiation. All right, so our genomic surveys over the years um, have given us a lot of insight into the um, overall organization of the respective genomes. So at first count, we published that there, was, um, there were over 16,000 chromosomes in the macronucleus. And at our latest count, um, just published at the end of 2019, we're now at over 18,000. So these chromosomes um, uh, can also be alternatively processed, um, but there are 18,000 different kinds, some of which might have slightly different uh, five prime or three prime ends. Uh, so there can be spliced variants at the DNA level as well. Um, at these, are built from and derived from a set of nearly a quarter of a million of these MDSs or precursor segments. So it's a massive genome jigsaw puzzle essentially to piece together a genome from uh, nearly a quarter million pieces of information in the precursor germline genome. Okay, and so this together, for example, in this seven um, segment uh, jigsaw puzzle of its own, like one dimension would be to form this particular chromosome here, just a schematic. Uh, so this one takes up seven pieces, but there are some cases that take as many as over 200 to build up a single chromosome. So here in this overall model, um, you have a single macronucleus, which is built of these sort of tiny gene sized chromosomes. One thing that might be coming to some people's minds is why is the macronucleus then larger than the micronucleus if it has reduced amounts of sequence complexity? And that's because these individual chromosomes, once formed, become amplified to a high level. So let's say this is the chromosome shown in blue. You see here that there are actually many different copies of the blue chromosome. And the average copy number is around 2,000. So in this sort of jelly bean jar model of the macronuclear genome, what you have is 18,000 different colors or flavors or types of chromosomes each of which is uh, present in an average of about 2,000 in terms of its copy number within this massive um, ensemble of DNA molecules found in the macronucleus. So actually in the virtual background um, that I'm speaking in front of, if you have that in view as an inset, um, that, is, that is a cartoon illustration of one oxytrica cell at the top. And below it, where I'm sitting next to, is um, a blow up of its macronucleus. You can see uh, an example of an individual chromosome there. I'll come back to that image later. So this process of genome rearrangement in oxytrica, um, while it might seem bizarre in some regards, um, in fact mirrors some processes that do occur when um, genome sequences in humans go rogue. And sorry if that's noise in the background is um, my barrage of email. So. Um, when some chromosomes become um, cancerous or precancerous, uh, a phenomenon known as chromothripsis sometimes takes place where chromosomes can break and rearrange in the wrong order concomitant with lost material, like the loss of, in our case, intragenic DNA as well as intragenic DNA. So we like to argue that one of the many, many reasons for studying organisms like Oxytrica as a model, not just for intellectual curiosity and understanding um, so much of the capacity for rearranging genomes, um, but is also um, the fact that Oxytrica seems to hold uh, a, a clue with regard to how to run this process in reverse, how to restore genome integrity 
um, in the face of um, the onslaught of insults that our genetic material faces all the time, whether that's from um, pollutants in the environment or um, whatnot. Okay, so if we now examine, um, this is a 30 kb window inside of the oxytrica, um, one region of a micronuclear chromosome, which encodes 11 different color-coded loci. So going back to that view, like in the jelly bean jar model, where each color ultimately becomes a distinct chromosome, one of the 18,000 types of chromosomes in the macronuclear genome. So you see some simple cases here, like piece one um, in green is, uh, needs to be joined to piece two in green, and then it skips over this sequence here and joins to piece three and four. Well, part of the sequence that it skipped over is another entire chromosome that just happens to be encoded in the inverse orientation. It's fondly labeled chromosome number 17,307 over here. So here you have two overlapping genes. Um, the, uh, the pieces in green, those four segments join and to put them in order, one, two, three, four. Um, but what is an eliminated sequence of the green chromosome is actually itself a simple example in um, turquoise of a chromosome that simply has to be excised and have telomeres added at both ends. And this is also a nice illustration where um, not only is sometimes the eliminated sequence of one chromosomal locus um, useful information for the genome and the assembly of chromosomes elsewhere, but also how sometimes there's very um, tight overlap between the end of one macronuclear locus and the beginning of the next. And this supports um, a machinery which probably processes, processes both ends to um, add telomeres to the ends of both the turquoise locus and the green locus. So uh, some other features here are that um, sometimes whole transposons can interrupt um, regions like in this blue locus down here between pieces five and six. And that supported um, a theory um, a, a few uh, decades ago from Larry Klobuchar and Glenn Herrick that many of the regions of the genome that are now excised um, themselves are relic transposons. Now, what I described in the first um, uh, cartoon images was scrambled loci. Here's one example of the 11 in this case, which is the locus in red. So here you have pieces one, two, three, four, five that have to join to piece six over here on the inverse strand requiring all these segments to be inverted with several other different um, chromosomal loci in between and then come back to collect um, pieces. Uh, so if you go over here, come back to p get piece seven after having inserted piece six between five and seven and then come back here again to collect pieces eight, nine, 10, and 11. So one case scrambled out of the set of um, 11 in this particular locus. That's actually a simple region of the genome because the genome-wide average is that 22% or roughly one in five loci require this phenomenon of descrambling. So what do we know about the molecular mechanism for how this natural phenomenon of um, chromosome editing or genome editing takes place in this regulated fashion? So remember that CRISPR is a process which edits one nucleotide or one gene locus. But in oxytrica, there are a quarter of a million um, gene editing events that have to take place during development to properly fuse all of these um, segments that give rise to mature chromosomes that can be transcribed to gene products. So um, now we're gonna zoom in on one case out of those 18,000 chromosomes. We have a precursor version where the segments are sometimes out of order. And we have a product version from the maternal or parental macronucleus, which is everything in the correct order. So remember I told you that when two cells mate, um, this triggers um, active, um, essentially activation of the, um, the germline, uh, the gametes essentially um, in the micronucleus, but concomitant loss of the old macronucleus. I didn't really emphasize that. So the old macronucleus is still found within the cytoplasm of those cells that are conjugating. And this gives it the opportunity to produce non-coding RNAs. And so this is actually a, an entire phenomenon that, again, like CRISPR gene editing, is regulated by non-coding RNA guides. Um, in this case, however, a set of both long and small RNAs. So the, what is referred to here as the new MAC is the developing macronucleus that is developing from um, the uh, now formed zygotic genome, okay, post-conjugation. So this is essentially a cartoon simplified view of what's going on in the early hours 
um, post mating of development of the new macronuclear genome. Well, first of all, before the old macronuclear genome is entirely disposed of, um, those old chromosomes we found are completely transcribed from telomere to telomere. Remember, because these um, chromosomes are on the scale of gene-sized units, they're just a few kilobases in length on average, okay? So um, we've also found um, that uh, RNA polymerase, RNA pol 2 is commonly paused at the telomeric sequences at the ends of all of the macronuclear chromosomes. So it's ready to transcribe the incomplete chromosome um, at the early stages of development. And this happens about 12 hours after the mixing of mating compatible cells. So this gives rise to putatively double-stranded, we don't know if they're really double-stranded, but transcripts deriving from both strands, both sense and antisense. And as most people stud who study molecular biology would know, like the students on this audience, um, when you have long double-stranded RNA, it's very commonly processed into smaller RNAs. And sure enough, um, hours later, we find that abundantly um, small RNAs of a particular class of 27 nucleotide pi RNAs, I'll describe them later, um, are produced en masse. And so you have actually thousands of long non-coding RNAs and millions of um, smaller RNAs that derive in sequence from them. Now, there seems to be a one or should be a one-to-one -one correspondence. So if there's 18,000 different types of macronuclear chromosomes, um, then we do predict that there would be 18,000 types of sense and antisense um, RNA transcripts. But um, my former student, Kelsey Lindblad, um, was only able to identify in the order of about 11,000 of them. And at first she was frustrated, and then we realized that this is actually one of the largest sets of non-coding RNAs for which we understand um, precisely what their function may be. And their function appears to be twofold, probably supplying the precursor to the small RNAs, but also providing template information that allows the rearrangement of these scrambled and permuted and, and um, cryptic uh, chromosomal loci in the micronucleus to rearrange to form the proper reorganized and interpretable information in the new chromosomes. So the small RNAs play a role of marking the regions of the genome that get kept. And this simply follows from the fact that the small RNAs derive from bite-sized portions of the transcripts of the previous generation's chromosomes. And so that means if a small RNA exists, for a region of the genome, then that means that that region of the genome should be retained in the next generation. Whereas if there's no small RNA for that region, then it can be destroyed. And in parallel, these long RNAs are multitasking and play another role where the long RNAs, um, we also refer to as the template RNAs, um, supply the order and the orientation. It says that one, two, and three should be linked together and that three and four have to be ligated even if uh, that is over a distance and requiring inversion sometimes of some of these segments. So the combination of information found in the long and the small non-coding RNAs um, seems to be enough to uh, supply the information to rewire this genome to produce a new set of 18,000 chromosomes. Okay, so experimentally, I have to say before lockdown, the last place um, I was able to give this as a department seminar was at the University of Chicago. So luckily the day before my seminar, I was able to go to the Art Institute of Chicago and you know, see this Surat painting, which I, I use um, in, to illustrate two different points. Um, one is that actually the number of points in a pointillist painting, such as this large one, is approximately equivalent to the number of pi RNAs that we think are in the oxytrica genome. So it's like fun fact number one there. So consider that each of these dots um, in the pointillist painting is illustrating, sorry, one of the regions um, of a genome to be marked. It says keep, this, this is part of the landscape of the mature somatic genome. But how to test the model um, as to whether or not um, these RNAs are encoding the information to program or reprogram chromosome order. Um, we did an experiment now more than 10 years ago with Marius Nowoski, who's in the lab. And actually I know I, um, I gave a seminar at the Carnegie Institute approximately 10 years ago when uh, these data at the time were fresh. Now I'm supplying it as background. So in this um, really keystone experiment that changed our way of approaching these problems in Oxytrica, our approach was to change the landscape. Okay, so the landscape like, you know, if, you, if we view Oxytrick as a genome jigsaw puzzle of a quarter of a million pieces of DNA, okay, and they have to be properly ordered, 
The way many of us who are impatient to solve jigsaw puzzles would be to look at the cover of the box. So if we change the landscape on the cover of the box, present that to Oxytrica, then that allowed us to test whether they are following the long RNAs as template guides. And so here's a description of the experiment. Um, we take an artificial sequence in the form of DNA or RNA and flip the order of two internal segments. Okay, so now if we present the cell with microinjection with an alternative RNA template or DNA template that can in the cell be transcribed into RNA that says the correct order is one, two, three, five, four, six, seven, um, then we could follow what happens in the subsequent generation. What we saw was precisely um, an easily assayable um, test over here because if we switch the order of segments four and five and then measure by PCR the length from piece four to the end of the gene, we get a shorter PCR product um, in the case where we have reprogrammed um, a switched order of segments four and five. And that's what you see happening in the next generation. What we also found was that in subsequent generations like F2 and F3 um, was that this uh, phenomenon propagated. And the propagation of this phenomenon across generations um, led to support of RNA-mediated processes that can reprogram genome architecture um, without the information coming from the original chromosomes. So it's extra chromosomal information coming in the form of these long non-coding RNA transcripts. Okay, a little um, shout out there to Lamarckian inheritance because it provides a bona fide mechanism for such. And here's some examples just showing that you can um, detect sense or antisense, again, sense or antisense not labeled in each of these cases, of three representative um, long non-coding RNAs for three different loci. Um, and that's, it, that was what we documented in 2008. And then, um, you know, 11 years or 10 years later, but, you know, just three years ago, um, we did publish a set of um, over 10,000 of these long non-coding RNAs that um, are transcribed during development. And we call them not non-coding RNAs, but they're actually they're complete transcripts of um, the chromosomes from the previous generation. So that means they encode the entire reading frame as well, but the version that they have would also include introns if there are introns present. So that's why we call them non-coding. Um, what we also discovered was that a few hours later during development um, is when the, there's this burst of appearance of 27 nucleotide RNAs, which I will describe in more detail now. So these small RNAs, um, which uh, do appear in terms of their sequences to derive directly from um, processed versions of the long RNA transcripts, uh, they tend to map entirely um, to regions of the genome that are kept. So what's shown here in a thick black line are the deleted IES regions. And these regions um, are never found with pi RNAs mapping to them. Okay, so this was in sequence or bioinformatic evidence suggesting that the pi RNAs, as we call them, because of their association with the PV protein in Oxytrica, um, most likely mark regions of the genome that get kept. Um, and uh, to jump ahead because of time, this shows also if we knock out the Oxytrica PV protein, um, we would find no, um, no production of the 27 nucleotide pi RNAs. Okay, so the functional experiment in this case um, to prove that the role of these um, oxytrica pi RNAs uh, was to mark and protect regions of the genome was to make artificial pi RNAs targeting a region that's normally deleted, like this IES or eliminated sequence between pieces six and seven. And if we introduce RNA versions, whether sense or antisense, um, into a cell during mating, um, again by microinjection, uh, what we would find is that it would program retention of this short sequence, so it's called an IES plus band or IES plus strain, um, because the product is just a little bit larger because the 27 nucleotide or actually 19 base pair sequence in between is retained. And so the pi RNA we would make would include this 19 base pair normally deleted sequence plus a little bit of flanking sequence on both ends, including the so-called pointer repeat sequence. So again, this is a phenomenon that propagated across generations, supporting this notion of RNA-mediated epigenetic inheritance, or that these small RNAs, like the long RNAs I described a few minutes ago, um, can both transfer transgenerationally information about um, genome architecture, in this case, whether a sequence is present or absent. Um, it also provided really um, a, 
a shift in paradigm of research in my laboratory because both of these methods methods showed um, that we could remodel or resculpt um, the mature chromosomes in cells grown in the lab. So now we can generate IES plus strains with great ease um, in the sense that we only have to inject small RNAs into a cell. And so, you know, anybody here who's done CRISPR genome editing um, injects new guide RNAs into a cell, but also has to usually introduce the Cas9 editing machinery. In our case, Oxytrick is ready to edit. It's got its own ready-made toolkit for genome editing, and we only have to introduce the guide. So by introducing a guide sequence, reprogramming the cell to keep a sequence that's normally retained, we're able to make um, knockouts um, somatically, which cannot express genes if we program it, for example, to retain a sequence that causes a premature stop codon or frame shift mutation. So this has become one of our go-to methods for manipulating the genome in the lab to make many different strains. Okay, so here I'm going to shift gears from talking about chromosome editing um, and past work of the lab to talking about work published um, within the past year, although actually it was last June, so now it's already um, nearly exactly a year ago. Um, and this is also explaining the background um, that I'm uh, sitting in front of um, while giving this Zoom lecture, my, my VR background. So work here, which was done um, in collaboration with Tom Muir's lab, um, who is at Princeton now, though he also used to be at New York, and led by former graduate student Leslie Bay, who's now a postdoc in Sam Sternberg's lab and actually working on CRISPR genome editing. So um, where, where we came in here was this view that Oxytrica has these elegantly tiny chromosomes. Okay, here's an example of a chromosome so small as to have only three nucleosome units that it is um, shown wrapped around and the magenta sequences at the ends depict the telomeres. So um, I'm sitting over here, you know, somewhere off um, in the paranuclear envelope space, I suppose. Um, so feeling very small today. Um, but what this illustrates is that Oxytrichus chromosomes are, are so small. In fact, some of them are small enough to um, have only one well-positioned nucleosome that Oxytrick is also a great model system, since this is a symposium about um, selection of models, depending on the biological question you are um, addressing. Um, this is a model system for studying chromatin biology, writ small. So we began, became very interested in nucleosome positioning and other aspects of chromatin organization, and thought about ways in which Oxytrick's tiny chromosomes, some smaller than a thousand base pairs, could be useful as a model for chromatin biology. So for example here, if you look at features um, such as in red transcription start sites, you know, every chromosome that we're looking now, just single gene chromosomes, because some actually do encode more than one. Um, so they all have a, you know, one well-defined um, transcription start site or TSS. They have um, a small number of well-defined nucleosomes across them. And this would be a, um, a simple idealized chromosome, an average of a lot of data. Um, and at the time we were studying um, oxytrica chromatin biology, the phenomenon of um, methyladenine or M6DA in DNA um, was becoming um, a, a, you know, newly talked about. It actually was, I should say, newly discovered because it was known to be abundant um, abundant modification in ciliate DNA um, for a long time, probably since the 1980s. Um, but its discovery in small quantities in human DNA, um, as well as in um, Drosophila DNA and um, uh, C. elegans and some other systems, raised interest about what is the role of methyladenine in chromosomes and in biology in general. So here we made the observation similar to one that was also made in the algae Chlamydomonas, which happens to be the food source for Oxytrica, uh, so another microbial eukaryote, that the methyladenine positions seem to lie in the um, space in between nucleosomes, okay? So this gives rise to a simple hypothesis that maybe methyladenine um, um, is, uh, or 6-methyladenine, is found um, in the linker regions between histones because that's what's accessible to the methylase machinery, the rest being protected by histones, or perhaps it is actually helping to guide nucleosome positioning. And we figured we could, we could address this model in multiple different ways in Oxytrica, one of which benefits from the fact that we can make synthetic or artificial chromosomes. Okay, so one of the first things that Leslie set out to do in my lab was to identify 
first of all, what is the methyl transferase in oxytrica that methylates DNA? Because also the methyl transferases for methyl adenine um, in DNA had been elusive. Um, and he found one of the reasons why it appeared to have been so, loose, so elusive. It was not a simple DNA methyl transferase enzyme, but actually a complex in oxytrica that appeared to depend on two um, methyl transferase um, catalytic or potentially catalytic proteins, as well as two DNA binding proteins acting together in a complex. And this is because these two proteins here, labeled MTA1 and MTA9, actually both derive from RNA methyl transferases not DNA methyl transferases. And so that um, is inferred by the fact that they contain these MTA70 domains, which normally methylates RNA with um, M6A. Um, but instead it tells a nice evolutionary story where the ability to methylate DNA in so abundantly in oxytrica seems to have been acquired by taking um, really a pair of RNA methylating enzymes and coupling them in a complex to two um, proteins with putative DNA binding properties. So you have um, an evolutionary scenario where um, the recruitment of a DNA methyl transferase complex to its substrate DNA was acquired by um, evolutionary co-option of an RNA methyl transferase, helping to explain in part the mystery of why DNA methyl transferases had been elusive in so many other model organisms. And this is just more biochemical evidence that you really need all four of these components to see any methylation of DNA um, shown there as well. Furthermore, we could also knock out the methyl transferase and we could do so by knocking out um, the catalytic component of those two MTA70 domain containing proteins. And why this is important is that this is a methyl, methyl transferase enzyme that has a preference for methylating APT um, dinucleotide motifs. Okay, um, but it seems to be actually critically important also for the whole genome rewiring and development of the organism because those organisms that we made mutant or deficient in the ability to methylate methyladenine, um, they entirely lost the portion of their genome that were methylated at AT dinucleotides, um, but they were also unable to complete development. And so this gives us a new clue as to another factor in uh, genome remodeling during oxytrica's nuclear differentiation, which is that there's an unrecognized role of DNA modifications in this process, um, because when the cell is unable to methylate adenine, it's um, unable to produce a mature macronuclear genome for the next generation. So we're not yet sure why that is the case, and that's something we're actively investigating in the lab. Um, the last benefit I'll mention for the, my, um, the minuscule size range of oxytrichous chromosomes, why are, they, why are they really, we sometimes call them nanochromosomes, the, the smallest unit of chromosome structure because they encode single open reading frames. Well, that gives us the benefit of making them fully synthetically in the lab as well. And so we made um, versions of oxytrichous chromosomes and a mini genome of 96 um, such chromosomes, either with or without methylation. And so their small size, again, makes them um, on the scale of what you can either make synthetically, building them up from modules, um, from oligonucleotides, or what you can make just by PCR. So if we PCR'd up 96 of the chromosomes in vivo, well, the versions that are biological extracted from the organism are gonna contain methyl groups. Um, but if you PCR them end to end, then that effectively erases um, any methyl marks, or for that matter, any epigenetic modifications or base modifications on the DNA because you supply a mix of simply um, uh, deoxy, A, C, G, and T into your PCR tube. So we built um, mini genomes and individual chromosomes, either with or without the endogenous methyl marks, um, as well as um, with uh, methyl marks moved to ectopic locations as well. So in this experiment, what I'm showing is if we view what's going on at a single chromosome that we built synthetically together with Tom Muir's lab in the chemistry department at Princeton um, before our move. And so what, what we found was that um, if you um, essentially erase some of the methyl marks, so the version in green is lacking methyl entirely, then we would find increased nucleosome occupancy in that region. So this supports a model where actively the presence of um, methyl deoxyadenosine in DNA is refractory to nucleosome occupancy. It is acting um, as a repellent 
to the positioning of nucleosomes. And we saw this again, if we moved, oh, sorry, ectopic is spelled wrong there. If we moved um, the M6DA to another location in the genome, which is normally um, uh, one that has no methyl groups here and typically would have um, relatively, um, as you can see in, in black with, with methyl, uh, uh, relatively low nucleosome occupancy, we could see that um, if, sorry, relatively higher nucleosome occupancy, if we add methyl groups here, we would knock down the nucleosome occupancy. So higher nucleosome occupancy in green, but in the absence of the methyl mark, you introduce more M6DA here and boom, away goes um, the nucleosomes that would normally be present in that otherwise well-defined nucleosome containing region. Supporting our observation or our conclusion that the um, 6MA uh, mark in DNA directly disfavors nucleosome bindings, both in vitro and impacts chromosome architecture in vivo. Okay, so here, um, obviously I wanna thank um, all of the participants at the symposium, but also thank the lab members like uh, Leslie Bay, whose work I just described in the latter half, and also the work in the first half that I described is that of former postdoc, Marius Novoski, former graduate student, Wen Wen Fang, um, and the genomics initially led by Estian Swart and Xiao Chen, and then carried forward by other current and past members of the lab. And if we were only in New York right now, um, and if Yankees games were actually playing, this would be a, a photo from um, a couple years back when my group had moved to New York, where we can just walk to Yankee Stadium and watch a game. So now I think if any of such games were going to take place, they would have to virtually um, show images of audiences um, that would be uh, filling the bleachers, but we like to you know, make it a lab summer outing every summer since we were um, since we first moved there. So thanks again to everybody. Let me also add that even though we aren't fully back in the lab yet, some members are. And one thing I'm definitely missing about my lab, as I showed right overlooking the Hudson, is the beautiful views from our lab windows and from my office. So my group is still actively recruiting new postdoctoral members and happy to chat with anybody here about possibilities. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Laura. It sounds like a fun lab outing to do. Um, we have time for one question and then um, you can answer directly the questions in the Q&A chat. Um, so the one question is from Ralph Greenspan and he asks, how much huh. of this do you think applies to paramecium? Oh, paramecium um, has most of these phenomena, but on a smaller scale. So um, it has many genes per chromosome in the macronucleus as opposed to this one gene per chromosome model and no evidence yet that there's any scrambling in paramecium. And there's a really e elegant explanation why. So paramecium has all of its segments, all of its uh, NDS regions flanked by the same repeat TA. So that's not enough sequence complexity to be able to support a more complex regime where um, the genome rearrangements could be out of order or inverted. Um, it has to be very simple, uh, given that they're all the same repeat sequence. So um, that's one of the reasons, and, and there's contrast with tetrahymen as well, but why oxytrica is one of the most elaborate of these different ciliate models. And also I want to say thanks to Ralph Greenspan, who taught me freshman biology back when I was at Princeton. Oh my goodness. Yep, coming full circle. <laughs>